Oh, this is going to be so much fun to talk about the many faces of HCC. There's your classic HCC, right? Cells look like hepatocytes. And then there's variations on that theme. And I love talking about variations on a theme. All right, so let's start by talking about one of the classic patterns of HCC, the so-called macrotrabacular pattern. This is a macrotrabacular pattern, and the way you define a macrotrabacular pattern is the present by based on the presence of this endothelial wrapping and the stuff between those endothelial cells is are the macrotrabaculae. This of course is diagnostic of an HCC. And as a baseline, this is what a classic hepatocellular carcinoma looks like, round nuclei abundant, slightly eosinophilic to pale cytoplasm, often distinct cytoplasmic membranes. So that's our baseline. Pattern number two, a solid pattern, fairly common, no trabeculae or no easily discernible trabecular architecture. Well, this turns out to be one of my most favorite patterns. All of us have our likes and dislikes, don't we? This really does look like steatohepatitis, right? So there's balloon cells, there's lovely Mallory Highland, there's probably some fat in here. The challenge with this pattern is that if you look at this under very low power, you might mistake this for alcoholic steatohepatitis and completely overlook the hepatocellular carcinoma. The easiest way to tell the two apart is look for portal tracts. Obviously with alcoholic hepatitis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you'll, you will see portal tracts. With steatohepatic pattern of hepatocellular carcinoma, all you'll see is the N unpaired arterioles. And if you're feeling awfully lazy, the one thing you could do is get a keratin-19 stain. That'll highlight the portal tracts. Mixoid HCC, this is the only case I've ever seen, and this is from the TCGA collection. And what is TCGA? I'll tell you at the end of this talk. The glandular pattern of HCC. Now, I think this is the pattern that causes the greatest mischief. In fact, this one was originally called metastatic adenocarcinoma, and you can see why. The cells look hepatoid, but there are other things that look hepatoid, but there's beautiful glandular formation. And to compound that, someone did a Mark 31 and it was diffusely positive. Now, a piece of advice, yes, Mark 31 is a marker for adenocarcinoma, but we don't really know what HCCs stand like and clearly some HCCs stain positively for Mark 31. So not one of my favorite markers when the differential diagnosis is an HCC versus an adenocarcinoma. And if you don't believe me, here's the arginine stain. This actually turns out to be entrapped liver, so watch for entrapped liver. But you can see the hepatocellular carcinoma is positive. And if you followed my previous talk, Arginine is my go-to stain for a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. So this was not a metastatic adenocarcinoma, but a gland-forming hepatocellular carcinoma. Relatively clear cell variant, or if you want to be very specific, this is more like the pale cell variant of hepatocellular carcinoma. And the paleness is caused by the accumulation often of glycogen. You could get a PS with and with it without diastase, but what's the point? Diagnostically speaking, perhaps this is the most challenging pattern you will ever see, the undifferentiated pattern. And of course, the challenge is how do you prove this is a hepatocellular carcinoma? Now, the reason why we eventually call this hepatocellular carcinoma is because we knew, and this was metastatic, we knew that the patient had a prior hepatocellular carcinoma. This was metastatic somewhere in the abdomen. And while it looked nothing like a hepatocellular carcinoma, it is the undifferentiated pattern. 
we did have one stain that worked. The albumin in situ hybridization was positive. Remember, albumin is fairly specific and sensitive for hepatocellular carcinoma. Every other stain, including my favorite stain, arginase 1, was negative. So between that prior history and the albumin, I was fairly happy to call this a metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma. But the bottom line is this pattern can be extremely challenging if you do not have a prior history of an HCC. Here's another pattern that can create a challenge. So if you do not have a conventional HCC, this is going to be quite a challenge. Fortunately, I think most of these are keratin positive. Do remember that sarcomas can be keratin positive as well. The other thing to remember is cholangiocarcinomas may also show a sarcomatoid pattern. The stain that often helps in these instances is albumin. If albumin is positive, you, prop, you know that it's coming or the tumor is derived from the liver. Albumin will not tell you whether this is a cholangiocarcinoma or a hepatocellular carcinoma. For the most part, none of the patterns we've talked about have any predictive information. They do not guide therapy. Perhaps the, the one pattern that, that has an impact on therapy is the lymphocyte-rich pattern, because it turns out that these tumors more often are positive for PDL1. Whether our oncologists actually use this information or not, I am not aware, but it is clear that these tumors, the lymphocyte-rich HCCs, tend to be more positive for PDL1. And remember, PDL1 anti-PDL1 therapy has been approved as a second-line therapy for hepatocellular carcinomas. All right, so this looks like a hepatocellular carcinoma, but it has a lot of stroma in the background. Think of three possibilities. When you see a lot of stroma, the first thing you should think of is actually a cholangiocarcinoma, which typically is associated with an enormous desmoplastic stromal response. The second tumor you should think of is a fibrolamella variant of hepatocellular carcinoma. And the third thing is a scarus carcinoma. Which of these three is this? Wait for the end of the talk. So it's scarus versus fibrolamella. So here's a fairly pretty picture of a fibrolamella HCC. It tends to have a central scar surrounded by the nodule. This was in a young kid. They're typically in young kids. They typically develop in a non serotic liver, although you can see them in older individuals. And these sometimes look a little like FNH. So I've often had trouble grossly distinguishing FNH from fibrolamella or HCCs. Fibrolamella HCCs are now defined by the presence of this fusion. And please don't ask me to say this aloud because this neither can I pronounce this fusion nor can I remember it. All right, so I'm going to show you four cases. These are from a collection of about 400 cases of HCC that the TCGA looked at. And the wonderful thing about these cases is there's morphologic data available, but there's also extensive genomic data, including the presence or absence of this fusion we talked of in fibrolamella carcinomas. So four cases, here we go. So this is case one, and you'll see a fair amount of fibrosis. On higher power, there's a fair amount of glandular differentiation, but again, see that lamellar type fibrosis. Very high power, again, notice that classic lamellar type fibrosis and that gland forming HCC. Those hepatocytes have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. To my eye, this is classic for fibrolamellar HCC. But again, remember, this tumor is defined by the presence of the fusion. Case two, low power, not as much fibrosis on the, as in the previous case, but there is some fibrosis in this little clumpy fashion. So this looks like a fibrolamella carcinoma in the sense that it has abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. It does have collagen, but is it really lamella? This is probably a fibrolamella, but I couldn't be absolutely certain. At least I personally couldn't be absolutely certain without looking at the fusion. All right, so case three, 
Now this looks somewhat different. So now there are fibrous septae. This case lacks that lamella type fibrosis, but almost as equally importantly, the background tumor cells don't quite look like a fibrolamella carcinoma. In fact, if anything, it looks more like a classic macrotrabacular HCC. All right, case four. Very low power view. There are fibrous septae. Don't look lamella to me. And there isn't as much fibrosis as we saw in case one. The fibrosis lacks that lamella quality. The cells do have that abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, but they lack that classic pseudoglandular. I use the word glandular and pseudoglandular interchangeably. These cells lack that pseudoglandular pattern that we saw, and that is so typical of a fibrolamella carcinoma. Well, it turns out that all four of these are fibrolamella carcinoma. This is case one, case two, case three, case four. And what this tells me is that not all fibrolamella carcinoma show that classic morphologic appearance. And that classic morphologic appearance that I'm talking about is this lamella type fibrosis, the pseudoglandular pattern. So you do need molecular assays in, in a proportion of cases. But do remember, at least the way we have started defining this tumor is not by the basis of morphology, but by the basis of a genetic alteration. And here's a quick summary slide. I'm not going to go over this in any detail, except to say that there is immunohistochemistry that you can use to support this diagnosis. The co-expression of keratin-7 and CD68 is supposedly a feature of fibrolamella carcinomas. That said, remember it is a surrogate marker and it, it, it works at times, but it is not consistent in, enough to be the defining feature of a fibrolamella carcinoma. And finally, this very pretty HCC. This is a scarce HCC. This was not fibrolamella HCC was negative for the fusion. And thanks for, as always, for listening. Here's a link to the TCGA slides. And uh, when you go there, you'll need this code. This is the code that defines hepatocellular carcinomas. Bye-bye.